Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis with the Daily Beast. He's their senior columnist. Friend of mine and friend of America. All right, our guest today is Rod Dreher. He's a senior editor at the American Conservative. He's written for the New York Post, the Dallas Morning News, National Review. And he's the author of many good books, including The Benedict Option, The Little Way of Ruthie Lemming, Crunchy Cons, and How Dante Can Save Your Life. His latest book is called Live Not by Lies, a manual for Christian dissidents. Rod Dreher, welcome back to the news. It's great to be here. It is great to talk with you, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on the book, but we're, we're recording this the morning after the first 2020 general election debate, uh, and I just have to get get your take, man. What did you think of, of what we witnessed? <laughs> do, do you really have to do this, Matt? It was <laughs> it was terrible. I, you know, it's weird. I, I watched this with my family because my kids are teenagers now. Like, let's have this first civic event as a family. And we all left just agitated and angry and anxious about the state of the country. And uh, as a conservative, I hate to say this is 90 percent the president's fault. Yeah, I can't help but think that at some level, I mean, it is a commentary on an individual, but it's also a commentary on the state of our politics and our country and how serious we are. And I, I'm really curious because uh, you you were obviously um, more than willing to criticize Trump. You just did. Um, and yet the book that you've been, that's just come out, it's fabulous. And that you've been working on for, for probably years now really focuses on the left, which I also see as dangerous. And, uh, I know that recently you lost a longtime reader who felt like you had uh, not been criticizing Trump enough, maybe because you've been focused on this other serious threat. I'm wondering about the tension of being focused about the social justice warriors on the left, but then also realizing we have a guy in the White House uh, with these strong like authoritarian tendencies. How, how do you balance that? Oh, that's totally fair. And that's a, a perfectly fair criticism. And uh, I'm somebody who did not vote for Trump in 2016. I didn't vote in 2016 because I was too disgusted with both of them. Um, and I don't know what I'm going to do this fall, to be honest. But I'm more concerned about uh, what the left pretends for our country than the right, uh, because uh, Donald Trump is an authoritarian, no doubt about it. But I think what the left is going to do, and even a nice guy like Joe Biden is going to be a, a gateway for this, is totalitarianism. And it's, impor it's an important difference between the two. In authoritarianism, all political authority goes to the party or to the leader of a party. I mean, this is political science. But there are whole areas of life that aren't touched by politics. An authoritarian only cares about politics. Doesn't mean he's good, but it means that, you know, this is, there are boundaries on where he thinks his authority extends. A totalitarian, on the other hand, believes that all of life is politics. Totalitarianism is an extreme form of authoritarianism. They're both bad from a liberal democratic point of view, but a totalitarian is much worse. Now, what I see the left doing is trying to politicize every single aspect of life and extend the power of the state into all aspects of life, including things that should never be politicized, like you know, sports and like schools and uh, things like that, and you know, social life. And it worries me so much more when you see somebody like Joe Biden, who's a good guy. You know, he's an ordinary politician. He's no Donald Trump. But what his party stands for are things like what he tweeted back in January, that transgender rights are the civil rights cause of the next generation. Well, guess what that means in practice? What that means in practice is it destroys girls' athletics. That might be a small thing, but not if, like me, you have a daughter and your daughter wants to be an athlete and has to compete against males. Uh, and on and on and on. That's a, you know, Again, that's a small thing, but this is the sort of thing that the left is trying to do uh, in, just with their the social justice ideology, move it to every aspect of life. So that's why I focus more on the left, because they to control almost all the institutions in our society. They control the corporations, which will be a shock to some of your liberal readers, but it's true. Control corporations, they control universities, the media, and so on. Uh, the only way you could think that this is even remotely 
equivalent is if you think that politics are the most dominant aspect of, of our lives. Uh, look, you could we could elect Donald Trump from now till kingdom come, and he's not going to be able to stop some of this woke revolution that is moving into every aspect of our lives. So when I watch something like the debate last night and I see Trump being completely appalling, I think it, we should never have to hear an American president uh, decline to say that he would accept the results of an election if he loses. Uh, that troubles me greatly. But then I think about when Biden gets in power, if Biden should win, when the Democrats come to power again, they are going to lock in the social justice revolution uh, at every level of government. Yeah. No, I, I'm sympathetic to to what you're saying, um, <clears throat> but I'm going to play devil's advocate and push back just uh, because it makes a good debate here. That's fine. So let, <clears throat> let me start with uh, with an area of agreement. So I think that uh, the, the the distinction between totalitarianism and authoritarianism is is an important one. Um, and I do think that the left has uh, it dominates the culture, academia, uh, Hollywood, you name it, they've taken over sports. You can't just watch a game anymore. It has to be uh, some political agenda thrust, uh, you know, upon us. Um, you know, likewise, likewise, I think, I mean, you know, the left is is policing our speech. They are trying to, in some ways, destroy our history, our shared history, which is something we're going to get into. You talk a lot about that in the book. So I kind of agree with you in terms of the magnitude, right? Trump wants to get reelected. He wants to uh, be powerful. And uh, that's kind of what he focuses on. And the left has like a much bigger ideological agenda. I think maybe two differences, though, right? So one difference would be Trump is president and he poses a, like a kind of a clear and present danger to liberal democracy, whereas in order in order for the left to uh, to be as dangerous, they have to sort of win. They have to win a civil war in the Democratic Party. Um, they have to actually gain power. And so that would, I think, be, uh, you know, certainly. Well, let's start with that. I How would you sort of answer? Well, that's one point. And the other thing I would ask is, and then I'm going to quit filibustering here, but maybe this is a matter of our perspective. I mean, you and I are both white male Christians. And so it stands to reason that like Trump is a less danger to us. He's essentially our tribe. Like Trump probably isn't going to come after white Christians. And so maybe like where you stand on this depends on where you sit. Hmm. Well, there's a lot there. Um, <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, no, no, that's fine. Well, I, I think let's step back a little bit and look at it from a more of a historical perspective. Um, in my book, Live Not By Lies, I talk about Hannah Arendt and her 1951 book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, in which she went back and looked at the Soviet Union and looked at Nazi Germany to see what was it about those two separate societies that caused them to open themselves and accept totalitarianism of the right and the left. And when you read Hannah Arendt's book and you think about our own society, it's scary as hell, to be honest. And I, I'm saying this keeping in mind both the left and our country and Donald Trump and what he represents. Uh, among the things that Arendt said make for a pre-totalitarian society are radical loneliness and alienation. And that is so powerful in this culture. I mean, we're, we're way past bowling alone, which was the thing 20 years ago. We've gotten even more separated. And technology has done a lot to do that through social media. So radical loneliness uh, and alienation uh, disrespect for institutions and hierarchies. Donald Trump, I have to say, has been an avatar of that sort of thing and completely disrespecting our institutions. But it didn't start with him, right? It, I mean, the Iraq War was a real, really radicalizing moment for me as a conservative. It really knocked me out of the Republican Party because I, I saw our the, the party I had been part of for all my adult life uh, completely lied about this war. But there are other th reasons, too, to disrespect hierarchies and institutions, but we definitely have that. And you also have a situation in which people will only believe stories or, or, or facts that fit their predetermined narrative. That is ubiquitous on both the right and the left here in our country. And uh, there's a, uh, Hannah Arendt says something really interesting. She said that there were people in these pre-totalitarian societies, Russia and Germany, who were willing, elites who were willing to see the foundations of civilization destroyed 
just for the pleasure of seeing people who had been left out of it before break their way in. We see that happening right now in universities when where reason is is uh, cast aside. I, I think of Professor Nick Christakis on the on the uh, quad at Yale in 2015, trying to reason with this social justice mob that was that was just shrieking at him. Right. I bring all that up, and there are even more things Aaron pointed out. But just to say that both of us, both sides in our country, are caught in this Weimar-like struggle um, where we can't where we are leaving the liberal democracy and its norms behind. It's happening for a number of reasons. It's happening, I think, mostly because of the way our culture is uh, is evolving. It's happening for technology. But we are finding ourselves in a, in a situation where we we have to fear the other side. And I look, I get why the left fears the right. Uh, and I hope the left should understand why, why we fear them. But I don't see a good resolution for this, Matt. I, I don't see how we're going to be able to restore these norms. And this is one of the reasons why I fear that we are going to find get to some form of totalitarianism, not only because Hannah Arendt's, all her, her signs are blinking red right now for discerning what is a pre-totalitarian environment, but also because I see no way out of it. We, the sides are so far apart and our respect for norms have been so degraded. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I can say, I wrote about this in 2016. I think Tim Carney wrote about this in 2016. <clears throat> but um, in the Republican primary, this didn't hold true for the general election, but in the Republican primary, if you look at a map of America and where there is high social capital, like where people join bowling leagues, Trump did very poorly. But in places where there was atomization, uh, and correct me if I'm I, I'm sleep deprived from the debate last night, so I may you know I may be mispronouncing some words here. Uh, I may have a Joe Biden type uh, performance here today, <laughs> but hopefully I'll exceed expectations like Joe Biden did. Um, but uh, so I'm not I'm not I'm not my most eloquent. Let me just say, uh, but Trump did not do well where there was good social capital, where people joined bowling leagues, where people played cards together. He did well where people go home and watch TV and don't know their neighbors. Why is it? So why is it that loneliness and isolation uh, leads to totalitarianism? Well, because the the person who is lonely, who feels disconnected from the society around him is easier to manipulate and is it's easier for him to fall for a uh, uh, a leader and a, or a scheme for a politics that promised to return to him what he's lost, right? So um, this is what the Bolsheviks did in in Russia. They they uh, appealed to people who felt uh, at completely at odds with the traditional uh, institutions in Russia. They promised them a sense of solidarity and a sense of purpose. Uh, they would make Russia great again, so to speak. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that that people who have been alienated, it, it, look, being alienated and alone and isolated is not the human condition. We don't want to live that way. We don't thrive that way. And when people offer us a, a way out, an easy way out, uh, we'll take it. And that is where you get how you get totalitarianism. Yeah, I, I should probably note um, that... Well, tell the story. You talk early on in the book about uh, a phone call you got. And I think that, you know, that's I should have set that up earlier. But I, but I think this this story is, is important uh, and, and explains sort of why why we're talking. You know, what, what is the what is the Obama line? Uh, the 1980s called and they want their foreign policy. back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this was. This is the reason the book exists. This phone call I got back in 2015 it was from a physician uh, at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I didn't know this guy. We had a mutual friend who gave him my number. And uh, he called me, introduced himself and said, listen, you don't know me, but I've got to tell somebody this. I think it's important. He said, my mother is an immigrant to this country. She was born and raised in Czechoslovakia. Uh, she spent six years in a prison camp under communism for her Catholic faith. She lives here now with me and my wife, and uh, she said, son, the things I'm seeing happen in this country now, in America now, remind me of what it was like when communism first arrived in my country. 
And it scared the doctor, as, as you might imagine. Well, when the doctor told me that, I thought that seemed really kind of alarmist. I mean, I, my mother is a little old lady, and she watches a lot of cable news, and she's scared all the time, too. So I figured that was probably that. So I get on the phone and called uh, this couple I know in, uh, in the U.K., uh, Bela and Gabriela Bolabash, they defected from Hungary in the 60s, and Bela became one of the world's great mathematicians at Trinity College, Cambridge. I said, hey, Bela, is is what this Czech woman said, is there something to that? He said, oh, absolutely. Every day, Gabby and I are reading the papers and watching the news thinking, this is just like our youth. So because I know Bela, and I know that he wouldn't make something up, I said, there's something here. And I made a habit, Matt, every time I would go out to a conference or to give a speech, if I would meet somebody who had grown up in the Soviet Union or in the Eastern Eastern Europe, in the Soviet bloc, I would just ask them, are you, the things you're seeing happen now, does it remind you of the old days? Without fail, they said yes. They couldn't believe they were being asked this question. And then if you talk to them long enough, they would say how angry they were that Americans wouldn't pay attention to them. And uh, so your next question would be, well, what kind of things are we talking about? And th their first thing is, to, is going to speech codes and into having to be terrified for anything you say uh, that it might be turned against you, that you can lose your job for violating orthodoxies that didn't exist the day before yesterday. And it goes on and on from there. So uh, that's the book. Uh, the, the first part of the book talks about how we got into this situation, this pre-totalitarian situation, where I think it's going. The second half is based on a lot of interviews I did with people in the Eastern Bloc and so in the former Soviet Union who resisted it, who lived with it, who resisted it, who survived it, and what their advice is for what we in America, how we should be thinking about what's happening right now and the things we should do to prepare for a situation that might become actually totalitarian. Yeah. And I got a whole bunch of questions, <clears throat> which will probably be disjointed. They, they may not they may not flow naturally, um, <laughs> but that's OK. Uh, so let's just go back to the alarmism thing. Um, like. On one hand, I. It, it seems very plausible to me that that we are headed toward, you know, maybe not the gulag, but some sort of sort of soft to totalitarianism, <clears throat> as you talk about, like where maybe people are not forced by the government to uh, to kind of go along with the dogma of the day, but but they feel compelled, right, by by uh, companies, by their by their employer, by the, the Twitter mob. And it definitely seems like things could be heading in that direction. On the other hand, like I feel like I've been warned my whole life that we were really close to some horrible thing happening and then something changes and America isn't like Europe and we are resilient and like something good happens. I mean, and so how convinced are you that that we are like on this uh road to serfdom versus, uh, you know, Reagan gets elected and everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm certainly a lot more convinced than, than you are. And I think it's because what I'm seeing is systemic that uh, the whoever gets elected president is is not really relevant. Or I wouldn't say it's irrelevant, but it's much less relevant than people think uh, relevant to the future of the country. And let me tell you why. Um, what we are seeing in this country now is we have we've had a whole oh gosh two three generations since the 1960s where we have been uh, we've cast aside the norms the the norms that uh, that originated in Christianity the social norms I mean this was never a formally Christian country but uh, we were a secular republic where all the norms all the moral norms were decided by Christianity. Well, we're post-Christian now, and that's that. It is what it is, but um, it, that also means that we what have, we've replaced it with is a sort of uh, what what one social scientist calls moralistic therapeutic deism, which is this belief that God exists and all He wants of us is to be nice and to be happy and be successful. I mean, look, you see that sort of pseudo Christianity across different denominations into the secular world. And even a lot of it, there's a version of it among conser religious conservatives. So I think that is our basic uh, social ethos. And with that therapeutic ethos comes 
um, a, a sense of being afraid of be, having our feelings heard, right? And that is what is driving so much of the social justice warriors today is the, the, the sense that one can never insult the identity of anybody else in the society, that hurting somebody's feelings is the worst thing you can do. But of course, they don't apply that equally. This is only, only from a left-wing perspective. And I, I think that while we have been so focused, so many of us have been so focused on politics, We've completely missed what the culture has done. And this is certainly a sin of the right. You know, I, I'm 53 years old. I'm a child of the 80s, the Reagan 80s. Uh, the religious right focused so much on getting the correct people elected and getting judges on the bench that it completely ignored how far and how fast the culture was switching to the left. So f uh, fast forward to today, what we see happening is... Uh, Left-wing culture, progressive culture, has uh, marched through the institutions. Uh, it has marched through medicine, for example. In my book, I talk about a doctor who was born in the Soviet Union, an American doctor born in the Soviet Union, who uh, says in his hospital now, none of the doctors are allowed to say no to anyone, any even a child who demands hormones for, for gender uh, confirmation, as they call it. He said, even if we know that it's the wrong thing to do, it is considered an act of bigotry to deny them hormones. And so we could lose our job if we do that. Little things like that are like the march of, of this sort of totalitarian mentality through our, our institutions. And, um, you know, there's just not a lot that a president, any president, can do to stop this huge cultural shift. And I think, Matt, to be honest, this is one reason why it seems so alarmist Alarmist to Americans is because our idea of totalitarianism comes from George Orwell and the Soviet Union, this idea that it's going to come from the government and it's going to be about gulags and secret police and all that. It's not. Uh, ours is going to be a much softer totalitarianism, more like Brave New World, where uh, the the powers that be control the masses, not by inflicting pain and terror, but rather by uh, manipulating our access to comfort and material success and status. What that means is that if you want to go into medicine or your kid wants to go into medicine, he or she is not going to be able to be a doctor unless they bend the knee at any number of woke um, principles. If they want to be a lawyer, they're not going to be able to be a lawyer if they go to a a conservative church that is, um, you know, that is not woke on LGBT issues, for example, and on and on and on. And people are going to see uh, the, our liberal democratic institutions, uh, the outward form is there, but inwardly things will have changed so much to where people have to live in a country where they walk on eggshells all the time and are terrified of violating the orthodoxy because they could lose their job, they could lose their status, they could lose everything. Uh, that's definitely possible. I also think though, um, <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of, of Trump and not just Trump, but like the, um, the right, the, the, the new right, um, that, that basically is, uh, trolls people and, and tries to create like alternate realities. But I guess my point is there is, there is a backlash against this, right? I mean, do you just feel like there, uh, there are too many, uh, the, the people on the left, the social justice warriors are young and, and too great in number and they control too much um, because technology has, you know, it's technology's done a lot of bad things, but it has leveled the playing field. And there are people on the right, there's going to be a backlash against this. I mean, there's people like Joe Rogan, for example, who are very powerful and very influential and who are pushing back against this stuff. Um yeah, so, Joe, Joe Rogan, yeah. who is not on on the right necessarily. He's well, yeah, fair point. Leader. He's like a he's like a Bernie Sanders supporter. Right, right, right. But but I think he is a great example, Matt, because uh, as you and I are talking, Joe Rogan is in the middle of a situation now where you know he just got picked up for Spotify for a hundred million dollar deal, and there are a number of people within Spotify, uh, employees at Spotify, who say they're going to go on strike if they don't, if Spotify doesn't take Joe Rogan's uh, allegedly anti-transgender podcast off the off the air. And um, and I hope Joe Rogan stands strong. He's so powerful now; he's hard to cancel. And so is J.K. Rowling, for example. But very few of us are as powerful as Joe Rogan or J.K. Rowling. I've got people. Just this week, I, I got an email from a reader of mine who's a teacher. In a, a school, a high school in the Midwest, 
who is being forced to go along with uh, gender ideology, he believes it's wrong. He, I, th- I think he must be a Christian of some sort, but he believes it's wrong. But he also can't say anything about it or he'll lose his job. Got an email from a, a tech CFO out in Silicon Valley who flies um, a, a pro-police flag out front. Some goon came by at his house, took a picture of the pro-police flag, uh, sent it in an anonymous letter to his boss and his bosses at his company with the address and name of the guy on there and said, uh, does your company really want to be known for employing white supremacists there? Uh. See, that's the sort of thing that, yeah. you know, when, when I when I read the New York Times story about Trump's taxes, I'm like, oh, that's terrible. He Maybe he's a tax cheat, but I'm not going to lose my job. My neighbors aren't going to lose their jobs because Trump might, may or may not have been a tax cheat. We could lose our jobs if the social justice warriors turn on us and try to get us fired from our everyday jobs at schools and our uh, running businesses and things like that. And and I think, Matt, this is, and this might be, a, this is a significant point to the book. I don't think they're going to control things through normal political means. I think that what we are eventually going to get in this country is uh, an American version of the Chinese social credit system, where we don't the, the government doesn't need to depend on uh, the legal mechanism for firing people or punishing them in some way. What will happen if we if we end up like China is all this data that is already being collected by major corporations now because of the way we use the internet or because of our smartphones and all our interaction with the so-called internet of things. Uh, They're collecting mass amounts of data all the time. They have it there and all they have to do is weaponize it against us to build data profiles for each one of us about the kind of people we are based on who we hang out with, where we go, how we shop and so forth. And if we do what the Chinese are doing, then we will be able, or the people who run this social credit system will be able to deny access to the economy and freedom to do things like travel, go to universities, things like that. We'll be able to deny it to people who have a low social credit score. Like in China, you know, if you do socially positive things like download the speeches of Xi Jinping, or, uh, you know, you could get a higher score and get more privileges. But if you do bad things, according to the government, like go to church or hang out with dodgy, dissident people, you'll get a lower score and you and your family and all your friends are going to suffer. Mm-hmm. That's a soft way for totalitarianism to come into this country. Uh, it, it's not going to be hard. I don't think people would, would stand for that. But this soft thing is happening without people realizing what's really going on. Yeah, I mean, there, there are people. I mean, right now, the people are very egregious. But there are people who uh, banks are refusing to let them do business uh, and good luck uh, buying food. Um, It's interesting, right? I mean, there was a time until recently, this was pretty unthinkable, right? You didn't have to get the mark of the beast, um, so to speak, right? If you grew your own food or you carried cash, then you could buy uh, whatever you needed and you didn't, uh, you know, you, your money spent just as well as, as mm-hmm. somebody else's, right? And I kind of missed the days when greedy people just cared about making money. It was ironically <laughs> better. Um, but you literally could be like finding uh, it impossible to, you know, <laughs> to get a job, uh, pay your bills, buy food because you were deemed outside of the mainstream on a position that used to be that used to be mainstream 15 minutes ago, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, and I think the whole experience of COVID, I mean, I certainly don't share some of the paranoia of some of my conservative friends about what's happening with COVID. I, I wear the mask and I don't mind wearing the mask. But I can see now that it, as COVID has shifted us more to a cashless economy, uh, this is uh, priming us to accept an all cashless economy like they have in China, or like they almost have completely in China which also gives those who run the system more control. In China now, because so much uh, commerce is done by uh, on your cell phone, um, they don't have to handle cash. Well, that makes things super convenient, but it also lets the state know every single purchase you make. And if the state wants to cut you off from the economy, it's just a matter of the flip of the switch. Well, if we get that sort of thing here, it really does become a, a real-life version of what the evangelicals say is the mark of the beast. 
And uh, it's not a joke. Uh, th- and that's the thing that kind of freaked me out. I, you know, I'm old enough to well, that, That's in Revelation, right? Like if you don't take this mark, then you can't purchase anything. You can't buy and... or sell. Yeah. And, you know, I... I grew up on the in the what, what was the left behind of my childhood, late great planet Earth, right? And when people really thought about that, and I, I remember when I was a kid reading that and thinking, "Gee, I wonder what that would be like. How would they pull that off if we have cash?" Well, now it's technology has made that possible, and I'm not. This book is not an apocalyptic book in the sense of yeah. like left behind, I, but. We do have to start thinking like that, and uh, and thank God we had these people um, that I was able to talk to in Eastern Europe who had some good advice for us. They don't say this is how you defeat it, but they say that if if you have to live with it, here's how you can live with it and without compromising your principles. And, and for me, because I work at the Daily Beast and they auto deposit my checks, I'm literally uh, susceptible <laughs> to this mark of the beast. Um, I want to before we get into the advice they have. I want to talk about the Christian angle specifically because a lot of the dissidents in the Soviet Union and in Nazi Germany too were devout Christians who didn't go along because it would violate their rights of conscience. <laughs> and um, and I think modern Americans today and in, in a in this you know woke world um, may face some of the same problem. You you made me uh, you gave me sort of an insight into something I, I didn't fully appreciate before. So this whole conversation about the prosperity gospel, which I've sort of been a defender of, because mm-hmm. I think that okay, look, I would consider like Christianity to be like a well balanced diet. You shouldn't live on Joel Osteen alone, um, <laughs> but a little positivity is as a part of your diet uh, isn't isn't a bad thing. The Bible's full of stuff about becoming prosperous and um, being a victor or champion, you know, uh, victory in Jesus, you know, and maybe that means uh, more in the afterlife, but we could argue about that. Um, But you raise a more practical point, which is that a, a faith that is about kind of earthly comfort is uh, pretty susceptible to falling apart if you are facing persecution. And so being prepared to suffer for your faith is pretty important if you want it to endure, not only for your own salvation, but in this world, if you want it to endure, you have to be prepared for that. It's something I hadn't really thought of, but it's an interesting insight. Yeah, and it is the bedrock insight of what these folks told me and that I put in in my book. You know, I I should start out by saying that... our Christianity, if it's only doom and gloom, then that's not faithful either. I, I remember sitting in a kitchen in Moscow talking to an older man who had been in prison as a young Christian uh, for his faith. And he said, look, you you have to be not just against something. You have to be for something good and true and beautiful. And if you're not, you're, you're going to go to pretty dark places. So let me just get that out there right now, uh, because I don't, I don't want to be heard as, as saying that we have to be dooming and gloomy. But we need a lot more doom and gloom in our Christianity in America because we have become so middle class and so comfortable. I'm talking about myself, too. Uh, This is the thing that really came out, Matt, when I I talked to all these people in the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union, that if you're not prepared to suffer for your faith, to suffer loss of comfort, loss of status, loss of friends, loss of freedom, and even if it came to it, loss of life, then your faith is not going to withstand persecution. And they told me that most Christians in uh, under communism capitulated. They either left the faith or they became uh, completely withdrawn. But those who didn't were those who were willing to suffer anything before they abandoned Christ and before they abandoned the truth. And on the, the truth thing, this is where many of them found common ground with non-Christians, uh, secularists, who were also dissidents, because the the thing that you had to be willing to do was to accept any degree of suffering before you violated your conscience, before you were willing to live with the lie. That's the title of the book, Live Not By Lies. That's something that Alexander Solzhenitsyn said to his followers in Russia just before the Soviets exiled him in 1974. He said, listen, we might not have power to change this government, 
But every one of us has the power to refuse to go along with the lie, to refuse to participate in it. Václav Havel gave his people the very same advice in a famous essay he wrote in the Cold War called The Power of the Powerless. This is the sort of thing that every one of us in America are going to have to internalize, that we have to refuse to live by lies too. But that refusal to live by lies only means something if we are willing to suffer for the faith. I think there's an ironic um, thing here, though, which is I feel like the Christianity that I grew up with in the 20th century which was consumer driven and convenient and it was easily mocked, right? I mean, Ned Flanders of the Simpsons <laughs> being maybe the avatar of that, right? But but the people you're referencing are heroic and dangerous and daring. And um so I, I think that by calling on Christians, look, and I don't I do not I do not want persecution. Uh for the church, but but facing a more adversarial country uh, or, or regime, uh, Christianity could become tougher and more serious and more dangerous and actually more romantic and appealing. What do you yeah, think of that? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be purified no matter what. And uh, but I, I think it's easy for people here in in America, and I've been guilty of this too to always fall back on the whole, the, the thing that Tertullian, one of the early church fathers said, the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. I would bring that up with our, uh, the people I interviewed over there. And, you know, they, they would sort of nod and say, yes, but, and they would point out that those regimes really did very nearly destroy Christianity there. And you have generations in, uh, in Russia, a, a land that was Christian for a thousand years, who don't know anything about Christianity because the institutions that carried Christianity and the people who carried Christianity in their hearts were all killed or almost all killed. So we have to be careful not to romanticize that too much. Nevertheless, you're right that uh, if it once it actually starts to mean something to be a disciple of Christ, then there will be people in this culture who are sick and tired of the lies who will be drawn to us. Um, I, I'm thinking, and I, I write about this in the book too, most of the book is focused on the Soviet Union, but there's a case uh, out of Nazi Germany, Nazi totalitarianism, that's really important. I, I talk about the the movie A Hidden Life that came out earlier this year by Terrence Malick, and it's the true story of um, the blessed Franz Jägerstater, who was a Austrian Catholic, a farmer who lived high up in the Alps, um, said his prayers, went about his daily life. Well, Nazism arrived in his village. There was nowhere to go to get away from Nazism. But because he had been so faithful and in, in disciplined spiritually in his life before the Nazis, he recognized the Nazis for what they were, totalitarians. And he and his family resisted them to the very end, even though everybody else in the village went along with the Nazis. Franz didn't. They bore the scorn of their neighbors. And Franz eventually went sent to prison and executed for being against Hitler. Now, the, the key point there in, in the movie is uh, Franz goes into his church at one point and he sees a man painting Bible stories on the wall. And uh, the, the artist says, you know, uh, I'm paint, I paint these for people who admire Christ, but Jesus didn't come for admirers. He came for followers. And you could tell the difference between an admirer and a follower when it comes time to suffering. That is so true. And that is something that we're, we are going to see right here in this country. We've seen it during COVID. I mean, look, uh, the, my Catholic friends say that, uh, who work for the church say that um, that they're not going to, they, they expect a whole lot of people not to come back to church when the COVID restrictions are lifted because they've gotten out of the habit of it, because uh, it just seems like a, a bother. I mean, this, is, this isn't this is sent to us by a totalitarian government, but this COVID thing has been a, a, a test for the church. And I think when I say the church, I mean all Christians. And a lot of us have really failed it. Here's a, here's a question I probably should have asked earlier. Um, but I, in, in the book, you talk about how so, social justice warriors are like early Bolsheviks. Talk about that. Oh, yeah. That that really clicked it for me, Matt, when I was uh, doing historical research. And I read this great history called The House of Government by a Russian-American historian, Yuri Sleskin. 
it's a history of the Bolshevik Revolution. And he talks about the origins of Bolshevism and the way the early Bolsheviks were as being a, a, uh, an apocalyptic millenarian political cult. And what did he mean by that? He meant that they saw, the Bolsheviks saw the world as being divided between the sheep and the goats. And that we can only ever restore the world to the paradise that was lost before exploitation by killing all the goats and by this having this apocalyptic kind of violence that will purify the public square of those who pollute it and then restore harmony and we'll, we'll be in paradise. Well, I mean, that is a very religious vision, and they believed it religiously, even though they didn't believe in God. They, The Bolsheviks acted like complete zealots. They wouldn't compromise with anybody. They thought the purpose of life was to gain power and to wield power on behalf of the sheep against the goats. Well, that's what our social justice warriors do. They see life as no, and truth as nothing but expressions of power. And uh, they, the, Solzhenitsyn said that one thing he learned in the Gulag was a line between good and evil runs not between the classes, but down the middle of every human heart. Well, the social justice warriors believe, as the Bolsheviks did, that the line between good and evil passes between not social classes, but identities, between the races, between the sexes, between the, the heteronormative and, and, and those who who aren't. And so when we see in our in our social justice politics, them dividing people up like this and hating people, not because of anything that people have said or done, but by, because of who they are. And the social justice warriors won't even treat those around them as human beings who have who have the right to to dissent. All they are are enemies. Just this week, I saw um, Richard Dawkins got uh, canceled. The, the atheist Richard Dawkins canceled from mm -hmm. Trinity College, Dublin, because uh, the social justice warriors there thought he might offend women and, and Muslims. I, I saw in that controversy a uh, an academic say, a social justice academic say, that she doesn't believe in debate at all, that she will take no no uh, invitations for debate because what we should have are conversations that are, as she put it, reparative, meaning that the only conversations possible are those in which the enemies of social justice, you know, uh, uh, sit there while everybody else confesses their sins. So this this is. I love these. I love the 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 verbiage reparative. Yeah, they've got a whole bunch of these lines that they can just throw in. And uh, they're shibboleths, right? Yeah, it's therapeutic, though. It's both therapeutic and religious. Uh, I, I got this, Matt, I got this amazing conversation a couple of years ago with a friend of mine, a European who was taking some grad courses at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And I had lunch with him before he went back to Europe in Cambridge, uh, Mass. I said, so what, you've been here at the at the most prestigious school of government in America, taught, you know, studying with the American elites, what do you gather? What's the most important lesson you've had? He said, the most important lesson is how fragile the American elites are. I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said that um, about half the people in his classes were Europeans. He was the only conservative. But he said that the professors would come right out at the beginning of class and say, well, we're not going to cover this, this, and this subject because some of you have come to me and said that it would trigger you. And uh, so we're just going to leave that alone. This European guy said, how in the world is your country going to make it when so many of the people who are who are being groomed for power and who have no doubt that they deserve to rule when they're that fragile? He said, this is not going to end well. And I think, Matt, that this too is one basis for the coming totalitarianism. They will use their power to punish down the line those who make them feel anxious and uh, and threatened. Uh, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> give me some advice. Um, so I'm a Christian, I'm a husband, I'm a father. I would like to remain gainfully employed. Uh, I would, uh, I'm not gonna betray the things that I believe in. How, how do I, uh, what should I be doing today to prepare for what you believe is coming? Well, the first thing you and your listeners should do is we should all 
um, get woke, so to speak, from the other side and, and begin to to pay attention. You mean, you, you mean red pilled? I mean red our, red pilled. Our okay, yeah. Thank you. Hey, you're you're more part of this world than I am. I'm just a humble scribe <laughs> who lives in a suburb of Baton Rouge. Um, yeah, get red pill and, and understand what is happening around us and how quickly it's happening. And I, I think this book I've written, Live by Live Not by Lies, will help do that. And once you understand what's happening, we have to do we have to start preparing ourselves in our families and also in groups. You know, I dedicate the book to this uh, priest, Father Tomislav Kolakovic. He was a Croatian Jesuit who was doing anti-Nazi work in Zagreb during the Second World War. He got a tip that the Gestapo was coming for him. And so he got out of the country overnight and went to Slovakia, his mother's homeland, to hide out. And when he got there, he told the Catholic students at the university, he said, the good news is the Germans are going to lose this war. The bad news is the Soviets are going to be ruling this country when it's over. And they're going to come for the church. We got to get ready. So what he did was get together small groups of believing Christians, all students, all Catholics, who had come together to pray and to study, but also to learn the arts of resistance. And he spread this network throughout Slovakia. The Catholic bishops said he was being alarmist. It wasn't going to be that bad. But Father Kolakovic had studied the Soviet system because he was going to be a missionary originally in the Soviet Union. And he knew how the Soviets thought. So sure enough, when the Iron Curtain came down, the communists came straight for all the priests and the bishops and the the little the network of uh, Christians that Father Kolakovic set up in Slovakia. They became the underground church and they were the chief resistance to communism for the next 40 years. I believe that we're in a Father Kolakovic moment here in America. It doesn't seem like it right now, but things could change very fast. And Christians have got to start preparing themselves internally, spiritually, to suffer for the faith, to be wise about it, but to suffer for the faith and to know when the line comes that we will not cross, that we're prepared to lose our jobs, our livelihoods, and our reputations before we'll sign on to the lie. We've also got to make these networks of mutual support for when members of our community, of our close community, our church, lose their jobs. They've got to have be able to know that the community is going to be right there for them. Yeah. And, and I think it obviously has to be a personal network. You can't email. Uh, if, if this, you know, <clears throat> if this really goes south, uh, you have to have personal relationships with people that you meet with, maybe in your home or, or something. Uh, I, another thing that really struck me and um, coming from the sort of re- domina- you know, denominational background I come from, this is not a, a part of our tradition as much as it should be, but the memorization of scripture. And, and I think is very important uh, to sustain you in case you don't have access to a Bible. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I got this story from uh, Dr. Sylvester Kirchmeri. He was a, a physician, a Catholic, uh, and a, a pillar of the underground church there. He writes in his memoir, um, uh, his prison memoir, that all the memorization of, Christ- of Scripture he did before he was sent to prison sustained him in prison. Uh, there's a story in my book from a, a Romanian Orthodox priest, George Kalshu, who said the same thing, when, that he was put into the worst prison and tortured in, in Romania. But the scripture he memorized and the services, the liturgies he memorized, they were able to keep him going in prison. So these are, it's a little thing. Uh, Matt, you know, it's like, well, we, we used to, everybody used to re- memorize scripture. A lot of people don't do it now, but those who yeah. did memorize scripture, they were prepared for the persecution for the time and they had no Bibles. Yeah. I mean, we used to memorize poems and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. I and mean, people don't do that anymore. My, my kids went from a classical Christian school to more of an evangelical school and <clears throat> I can, it's a problem. Uh, there's some good things about the new school, but, but I love the the memorization. Uh, so I'm going to have to do that for now, at least on my own. By the way, you you talk about in the book, this is not an original point uh, to you. I've, I've heard a lot of people make the point that social justice warriors and sort of uh, the woke left is essentially a religion, right? I mean, it's based on, uh, I personally think that we have this need to worship something. And, and, if, and if you're not worshiping the divine, you're going to like worship politics. But uh, I think clearly you you make that point in the book that, um, that that this is like a religious thing for them. Oh, it absolutely is. It's based on revealed truths that can't be uh, can't be disputed. 
And uh, as I was, we were talking earlier, it, it's based on a vision of the world that divides people between good and evil, sheep and goats, based on their status. There's a really chilling quote that I, I put in the book. It's uh, from a guy named Martin Latsis. He was a uh, uh, one of the senior KGB officers in in early uh, early Soviet Union, and he was and it was 1918. He was trying to explain what the Red Terror was. This is a, a a campaign by Lenin and the others once they took power to eliminate all opposition by terrorizing and murdering all their all their opponents. Martin Latsis says that uh, trying to uh, trying to instruct uh, young Bolsheviks on what to do, he said. Just look and see what social class they are. That's how you'll know who the good and the evil are. That is the essence of the Red Terror. So today, when I hear the sort of language uh, demonizing white males, for example, I get a flag goes up because this is the same kind of language that was normalized in in Soviet Russia that led to the the death and displacement of millions of enemies of the regime. Uh, it's really, really dangerous to set to separate people that way by giving them a, a label and an identity and deciding whether they're good or they're bad based on that. And that's what the left is doing with identity politics, although they they have their good identities and their bad identities. I think that is unfaithful to Christianity too. And I'm sorry to see so many Christians falling prey to this and 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 believing that they're standing on the side of justice when they're not standing on the side of any kind of biblical standard of justice. At all. Yeah, it's un-American and unchristian, and sadly, it's uh, it's taking over. Yeah, but can, um, can I just say this real quick yeah. on that point? Uh, on the other hand, we cannot be blind to real social injustices. I, I was at a dinner in Moscow, and this is in the book too, but I was at a dinner in Moscow late last year, and I we had been talking with this family, uh, this Christian family about Bolshevism, and I said, gosh, you know, I just don't understand how anybody fell for what the Bolsheviks were offering. The father said, you say that, but let me tell you what happened in this country. And he led me then on a 300 year tour of Russian history in which it was just one thing after the other of the powerful exploiting the weak. And the church was part of that too. And uh, by the time he got to the end of it, you know, he said, so, you know, you're, you're right to say the Bolsheviks were wrong and that what they, what they promised were evil, but you have to understand they came from somewhere. The the people in power in this country, in Russia, uh, m- created the conditions that made Bolshevism possible. I think that's a powerful lesson that we have to be aware of here too. Absolutely, and and you and you write in the book the difference between like true Christian social justice and secular social justice. What's that difference? The difference is that in uh, secular social justice believes that we will achieve social justice when we have rearranged all the parts in society to represent the proper relationship of power, of different power centers. Christian social justice, biblical social justice, sees each individual person as a child of God and says that the just society, the completely just society, will never be created this side of the second coming. But a society can be more just when it aligns more closely with the the teachings of Christ, when it allows individuals uh, within that society to live out uh, to the fullest extent their human dignity as children of God. Uh, Any social justice scheme that violates what we know from the Bible to be the truth, and, and specifically the truth about the human person, can't be considered justice. So I think the term social justice, it originated by, with a Jesuit in the 19th century, I think. And it was originally a Christian term, but it has been completely co-opted by some pretty, uh, pretty uh, bad actors, I'm afraid. I guess lastly, I just wanted to ask you about um, your writing at The American Conservative. Um, <clears throat> a lot of us were bloggers at some point, and uh, the blogging... You know the blogging platform, the blogging media is 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 pretty cool, right? You're you're sort of having like a dialogue with your readers. You you're very like kind of transparent and honest. You'll post like criticisms from your readers, um, you know, emails that you get. Uh, it's sort of a, a dialogue in some cases. It's it's your evolving positions. You don't feel like you have to kind of have a fully developed take all the time. 
It's frequently updated. Um, you can include like large quotes, like sort of block quotes from other people. And I love that medium, but for, for whatever reason, most of us, um, have become, we've either been pushed out of the business <laughs> or we've become columnists and, um, and I'm a columnist and, and there's a lot of good things about being a columnist, but, but it doesn't include most of the things I just described about blogging. And I guess I'd love to get your take on like how you were able, because you're one of the only bloggers left, I would say, right, uh, right. really, who's still doing it, who hasn't changed. I mean, um, how were you able to endure and, and talk just about what you like about that medium? Well, you know that that is such a good question. I, I time has passed without me realizing how, how much it has passed. You know, I uh, blogging was still going pretty strong when I I, I left the East Coast in, in 2011 and moved back to my home state of Louisiana after my sister died, and the American Conservative was gracious, allowed me to continue writing my blog from Louisiana, and I'm still here. But uh, I just, I never really got worried about the fact that blogging was ceasing to be a popular medium and just kept plugging away at it. And uh, my my readership has continued to grow. Now I get between 1.3 and 1.6 million page views every month on my blog at the American Conservative. People really like it. A half of my readers seem to be liberals and I exasperate them most of the time. And I say, why, why do you keep coming around here if everything I'd say, <laughs> you hate it? And I said, well, because you're really smart, you're a really good writer, and we like the conversation. And they say, and I think this is key, Matt, they say, you know, we can have conversations in your comment section. I moderate the hell out of that comment section and spike comments from people on the left and the right that are racist, anti-Semitic, or harassing other people within that forum. It takes a lot of work, but people really like that. And as it has become less and less possible to have these sort of conversations, cross ideological conversations in real life, uh, I'm finding people really like that they can do that in the comment section of my blog. Plus, I think you're right that they like the fact that they're seeing a real human being here. I'm not just some, uh, I'm not just a, a symbol of a certain ideology. You know, I'm a conservative, I'm a Christian, not a Republican. Uh, I'm an Orthodox Christian, Eastern Orthodox. So that kind of puts me, uh, gives me a skewed view on American society that some people find interesting. Um, but I try to bring all of that to what I do. And I've created this brand of the guy with the crazy hair and the weird glasses mm -hmm. who has, um, who's got friends on the left, friends on the right, and who might drive you crazy, but he will give you a take uh, that, that you're not going to find other places. And I think people appreciate that. Yeah, it's refreshing. It's 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 fun, sometimes scary, but it's always interesting and it's contrarian. Um and but always again, always interesting. Okay, can I can I say this real quick? This is why I love Joe Rogan. You know, he's he and I are not aligned politically, probably, certainly not culturally, but I've started listening to him and gone off of NPR because I've been an NPR devotee for a long time, most of my adult life. But when I listen to NPR now, I feel like I know exactly what I'm going to get. There's no curiosity there. It's all about virtue signaling. With mm -hmm. Joe Rogan, even if he doesn't agree with me, um, I feel like I'm listening to a real person interact with real people. And I love that. I'm starving for that. Yeah. No, I think authenticity is vital. And um, I completely agree with you. I don't always agree with Joe Rogan, but it's an interesting podcast. He's funny. He doesn't claim to have all the answers, um, but it's working. People are people are tuning in, and, uh, and people are reading you. And I hope with all those um, page views, you'll link to this because I think it was a super good, interesting, and nuanced conversation. Um, and I think everyone should go. By the way, bef before I plug the book, this is am I right? Number the number one book on Amazon. It it, it was on the day it debuted. Um, it stunned me. Yeah, number one on Amazon. Uh, I had appeared on Tucker Carlson tonight, the night before, and um, it really I mean, Tucker moves books. But I'm getting <laughs> lots of really good reviews, lots of good attention uh, by podcasters like you, and uh, it's a book that really speaks to the moment. And people are anxious about what's coming. They want some sort of answers. And uh, I got to tell you, man, I somebody who remembers the Cold War, uh, I 
cannot believe how all of that has been sent down the memory hole in American popular culture. I'm hoping this book will revive interest in it and will send other writers and journalists to Eastern Europe to talk to these people while they're still alive and get their stories. Me too. That would be a great thing to come from this. Uh, and let me say, we may not have quite the reach as Tucker Carlson, but I do want to, and I want to get the reputation that if you come on this podcast, this small little podcast, a humble podcast, that we, our listeners will buy the books because we can't get big names like Rod Dreher if we don't support <laughs> them. So go get the book, order it today, go, uh, wherever, Amazon or your local bookstore, barnesandnoble.com, wherever fine books are sold. It's called Live Not By Lies. Rod Dreher, thank you for coming back on the news. Matt, it's always great to be with you. If you like this podcast, rate and review it on iTunes. Follow Matt on Twitter at Matt K. Lewis. Thank you for listening to Matt Lewis and the news.